Mm-hmm. Right, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good. Welcome to worship here at Woodlawn United Church. Uh, if you are new or visiting, uh, especially a warm welcome to you this morning. Uh, but uh, also to those who are watching online this morning, watching our live stream service, uh, a big thank you to our tech team up there for all of their uh, work and their assistance and allowing us to be able to communicate in so many different medium. And uh, just a reminder that following the service this morning uh, in the fellowship hall downstairs, uh, there is a time of coffee and refreshments. Uh, thanks this week to Murdoch and Connie Morrison. So thank you for your hospitality today. And we hope that uh, you are able to stay for some time following the service. Also, just to note, uh, Maggie Healy is our uh, Sunday school leader in the back, she's waving her hand, and she's got uh, an, uh, some activities planned for the kids today, including a scavenger hunt, so we might hear a little noise in the background somewhere, um, but uh, any young people who are present are more than uh, welcome to join Maggie uh, for, that, uh, for the Sunday school program today, so just to be mindful of that and uh, know that you are welcome some pastoral announcements to share with everyone this morning. We do extend condolences to the family and friends of Pat Rodenizer, uh, who died recently. And also, we extend uh, condolences to Pat Connell on uh, news of her death, uh, this, of her sister's death, uh, Elaine Whiteway. And so, uh, to Pat Connell and also uh, 
to the friends and family of Pat Rodenizer, we uh, extend uh, deepest sympathies uh, during this time, and we do hope that you uh, feel the strength and the comfort of the prayer of others through this time. I notice that there's an anniversary, uh, a note of an anniversary in the bulletin for Peter and Maureen Wood celebrating their 52nd tomorrow. I was looking at the picture, Maureen, were you like 13 when you got married? I'm just wondering. <laughs> Anyways, congratulations to you, uh, and it is good as a it is good as a community to celebrate and to celebrate with one another. So, to anyone who's celebrating an anniversary or a birthday, uh, may you know God's blessing on those special occasions and those special days. Um, Gus uh, and Lisa were busy working in the book room this past week, so Gus has an announcement around that. the stage. Uh, we had some wonderful volunteers come in and, you know, really go at reorganizing. Still got to put labels up, so there's a little mystery to it at the moment. You got to figure out which sections are which, but they're nicely organized. Some of them are even alphabetized. Check it out during fellowship time, nominal donation, free books, and uh, there's lots of kids' books there. And yeah, enjoy. Great. And where is that book room located exactly, Gus? Uh, so you, you got the stage downstairs, and on this side of the stage has a big sign on it, book room, and it's the room with all the books in it. Yeah. Uh, there you yeah. go. That makes it a lot easier for me now, Gus. Thanks. <laughs> Um, we know that during this pandemic time, it seems like, you know, internet fraud and scams have become more prevalent, and certainly the church isn't impervious to this, and uh, we know that some this past week may have received a fraudulent email containing Reverend Mary Lynn White's name. Mary Lynn's not with us this morning, she's on steady leave this week, but uh, we know this happens, so just be mindful when you receive certain emails or someone's asking uh, of a particular request uh, from you that uh, if it looks suspicious, it probably is. And please just check in with the church office before responding to any of those emails when they come through. Uh, if you have any announcements that you would like to share with the community, uh, please let the office know that we might be able to include them in our weekly announcements and bulletin uh, that are emailed out each week. And if you're not receiving that email and would like to, please let the church office know. Friends, uh, as we gather, we do so as the Congregation of the United Church of Canada, and as we seek to live out our apology to the Indigenous peoples of this land, uh, we acknowledge with gratitude that we live and worship on lands that are by law the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. So may we live with respect on this land and in peace and friendship with its people. And let us give God, cra uh, give God praise, I invite you to stand, that we might say responsibly our call to worship. Praise God with all your heart, before the gods sing praises to the living God. The word of God transcends all things with a holy mystery. An eternal spirit that responds to our needs, giving renewed strength for our souls. Although God is above all, God's care and concern extends to the last and to the least, to all creatures, great and small. The Lord of life has a purpose for us and a love that never ends. May this time of worship transform each of us into a people who believe that faith And I invite you to join your voices in the singing of hymn number 399, God Whose Love is Reigning O'er Us.
as we gather in this Easter tide and the season of resurrection. We remember how Christ has come into the world to be a light for the world, a light that even death could not overcome, illuminating the way to a life that is everlasting and an energy that is deeply sacred. So let us gather in the presence of the sacred We listen for God in the silence and even as we pray. O Holy One, we gather together in your sanctuary this day and we come as we are. We come uh, for a moment of refuge a moment of reconnection, a time when we might just give back to you a bit of this great gift of life we have been given. The world does not always make sense and life has its many challenges. But we pray in this time and in this place that we might come to behold a deeper purpose and find renewed strength to, the peop- to be the people you have called us to be, to be the church you have called us to be, that others might come to know the great gift of life found in you, and that we might be a people of love, of justice, of kindness, and peace, who follow the way of Christ Jesus, the one in whose name we pray, the one who is risen. Amen.
As we continue through the Easter season, our text today recalls another appearance of the resurrected Jesus before his disciples. This one comes after Peter and the others had left Jerusalem and returned to their homes in Galilee. Not only did they return to their homes, they also returned to their former livelihood. As we learn, they have gone back to fishing. The disciples weren't having much success. That was until Jesus appeared. In this account, specifically with his disciple Peter, the call is to once again follow me. A reading from John chapter 21, verses 1 to 19. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there were Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish. They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, is, it, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not able to land it. Only after only about a hundred yards off of shore. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish with you that you have caught. Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand, and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me. 
Here ends the reading. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you to our choir and Jim for your direction this morning. Always uh, great to sing those spirituals, and uh, especially through this Easter season. So thank you again for sharing your gifts. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, in whom we live and move of our being, as your people we gather in this sanctuary, you hymns of praise, words of prayer. And as we reflect on the words of Scripture, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable unto you and contain the life of Christ, that we might be your people. Amen. Kind of hoping this microphone's going to hang in there. It seems to be every now and then it's dropping a bit, I think, but we'll see. Anyways, this morning I, I wanted to begin by telling you a story. And it's a story about this minister who would stand before his congregation every Sunday morning and he'd say, You know what, folks? You're on a slippery slope. Whether you know it or not, you're bound for hell. And you know what? The people didn't stop coming. They came faithfully each week. And, and, you know, when it was time for the minister to move on, the congregation, you know, they reluctantly said goodbye, and some of them even went. And so the congregation called a new minister. And on the very first day, the minister stood before the congregation and said, you people are all bound for hell. You're on the road to ruin. And this went on for a few weeks until, you know, the church elders figured, well, they better have a talk to this fellow. And so, when they met, the elders expressed concern over what this new minister was saying. Well, the minister replied, I was, I don't understand, I was, I checked, and I wasn't saying anything, you know, different than what the previous minister was saying. And the elders responded, they said, well, yes, he said, but, but when he told us we were going to hell, he sounded sad about it. Because that was a case, you see, of it's, it's not only what you say, but how you say it. And I think we all begin to realize that sooner or later in life, that how we say things seems to matter as much as what we say. But, you know, something else I think that matters, especially when it comes to living faithfully, you know, and acting what we believe, it's how often we say it. Consider this exchange between Jesus and Peter in this text that Jerry read for us. Three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. And we don't know how Jesus said it. I mean, we don't know if, you know, he was pointing to the boats and to the fish and to the nets or if he was referring to the disciples who were present when he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And, and did he whisper gently in, in Peter's ear and say, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Or did he look him straight in the eye and challenge Peter by asking, Simon, son of John, do you love me? All we know is that three times Peter is asked by Jesus. And three times Peter responds by saying, yes, I love you. I love you, Jesus. I love you. You know, how often Peter is asked that question in this story and, and how he is required to answer those three times, it has a lot to say to us. I mean, because let's think about what Jesus is saying. Each time Jesus addresses Peter, in this instance, as Simon, son of John, and that's curious, because back in the first chapter of John's Gospel, when Jesus initially meets Simon, son of John, he says, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter, which means rock. 
But here in the last chapter of the gospel, Jesus doesn't call him Cephas or Peter. He calls him Simon, son of John. I mean, was Jesus saying that Peter had lost his place as a disciple? Was he no longer the rock? I mean, no wonder it says that Peter felt hurt. But you see, the reality here is that Peter, or Simon, son of John, had gone off course. And he was on the verge of missing his calling. And it all started back on the night Jesus was arrested and Peter's threefold denial of knowing Jesus. I mean, it's significant because according to Roman custom, you know, during the trial of Jesus, Jesus would have had an opportunity to have someone speak on his behalf, in his defense, someone who knew him, someone like Peter, who instead denied being a disciple and denied knowing Jesus. And then further, you know, as we get to this reading today, I mean, Peter and the disciples, they've already encountered the risen Jesus. The text makes note, this is the third time that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. Uh, last week's reading, we heard how, you know, the disciples had been locked in a room, and then Jesus appears, and they're sent out in the Spirit. But what does Peter do? He goes back to what he did before he knew Jesus. Before he was called Cephas, or Peter. And he goes fishing in the Galilee. Peter doesn't seem the least bit interested in being a disciple. But as the text tells us, his return to fishing is fruitless. I mean, he and the other disciples are out there all night. They catch nothing. That is until Jesus appears. And when Jesus is present and they listen to his voice and they follow his directions, their nets are full. And Peter's so excited that Jesus is there to help that he jumps into the water and he swims ashore to meet him. I mean, in some respects, we read this passage and, and to me it's describing the resurrection of Peter. I mean, Peter is finally coming around and recognizing his true calling as a disciple. It's there on the beach next to that smoldering fire just after Jesus had cooked them breakfast and fed them that Peter's threefold confession is now answered by Jesus with this threefold directive to feed my lambs, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep. Right? Peter could no longer run off and be Simon, son of John, anymore. It was time for him to discover his true calling as a disciple of Jesus. Time to speak the words he wasn't able to say the night Jesus was arrested. The words, I love him or I love you. I mean, Peter understands what it means to be a disciple. Right? What Jesus says to him, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. This is Jesus describing the life of discipleship. And it's Jesus saying, you know, look, Peter, maybe you used to do your own thing. But now the time has come for you to discover the life God has for you. It's time to follow me and listen to the spirit that says, I love you. Because it was this confession of love that brought Peter to life again. And you know how many others have found their calling in Christ's love over the ages because of that confession that Peter makes. I mean, God knows the world would be a different place if we not only listened for the voice of Jesus in our lives, but actually responded with a similar confession of love. Because words of love are, are what this world needs more than any other. I mean, if Jesus, the Son of God, needs to hear those words, I love you, then what does that say about the rest of us? I mean, yes, how we say things can matter. But more important is what we say 
and to whom? And how often? I mean, words of love need to be spoken over and over. We need to hear, I love you. Right? Even Jesus needs to hear, I love you, over and over and over. And those three words can be very hard to say over and over and over in a world where we are constantly being given reasons why we should not love. I mean, it's evidently not hard, but quite easy for some to speak words that generate fear or suspicion or even hate over and over and over. Words that seek to tell others that they are not good enough and even convince others that they are not good enough or the world is not good enough or certain people are not good enough. Words that cast doubt and further isolate us from one another even from the creation we share. I mean, words that are anything but life-giving. Because, you know, if you don't think something is good enough for you, or if it meets your standards, chances are you will have little or nothing to do with it. You or I can look at something or someone with a bit of a cringe and say, yeah, I don't think so. And it happens a lot. In fact, there's, there's plenty of research of late that backs us up. Research that has shown, for example, of how some of the most shared information in terms of news articles and social media posts on the internet are ones that generate angry responses in readers. Think about that. In fact, you know, last October, the Washington Post published an article that revealed how Facebook engineers gave extra value to certain emoji reactions, including angry in order to push more emotional and provocative content into user news, news feeds. Right? I'm not sharing this because I want to generate anger towards Facebook or their employees. I say this to help us understand how in a world where it can be made easier to express anger and even hate, the words I love you become hard to say. And if there's something we can take from this text today is how as followers of Jesus, we have a calling to speak words of love to others. Words of love that feed the souls of others rather than seeking to destroy them. I mean, there's something symbolic about Jesus cooking breakfast for his disciples on the beach before Peter makes his confession. I mean, yes, Jesus calls us literally to feeding the hungry as an expression of love for neighbors and for strangers. You know, we participate in the Dartmouth East uh, Christian Food Bank here on the corner. It is the Son of God. Jesus also knows of this deeper hunger for love. Right? Love that was shown to the crucified, to the rejected, to the shamed even to those who are angry and fearful. See, it's the love in our hearts that needs resurrection at times. In a world where there is cold judgment and hard facts, I mean, for countless individuals, words of judgment ring louder and strike deeper than any word of love. And that's why, you know, I like to say, you can hear a thousand words of praise, you could, but it's that word that's, that's spoken in anger, or suspicion or criticism that's the one that always sticks why we can hear the words God loves you and Jesus loves you and they can go in one ear and out the other and I suppose if that's the case then Christ does die in vain but I hope not because when Christ is, is nailed on the cross, he becomes that source of shame. I mean, even resurrected, he bears those scars. And he shows why it can be so hard to say, I love you. Because of how others can respond in anger and suspicion when all you're trying to say is, I love you. On the day Christ died, it was, you know, those words of hate and those judgments, those other judgments that seemed louder. 
I mean, as, as an eternal event, we might say that it is on those days that Christ dies that the words of hate and harsh judgment still have their greatest power. And this is why, like Peter, we have to look at the one that we have rejected, the one that we have denied and say, I love you. Because when we do this, the world is fed and the possibility of life is resurrected. I mean, we may not see this as a mission in life to say, I love you. I mean, we may be resistant to it because at a deeper level we understand, you know, what Jesus meant uh, when, when he said to Peter, you know, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and, and take you where you do not wish to go. Because we understand that that life of discipleship, you know, faith in God's love, you know, we'll do that to a person, take you to places you never imagined, doing things you, you never imagined you'd be doing. But it's by that, that strength and that love that life is fed. You know, I, I liken it to a, a time I was leading a group through Israel. And, and it's a place, by the way, you know, Israel, Palestine, the Holy Land. You asked me 15 years ago, I had absolutely zero interest in going there for a visit, let alone feel inspired to bring other people there. Well, it was an experience I had on the Sea of Galilee, you know, Lake Tiberias, it's referred to in the text today. And we were on a boat that was named, of all things, Faith. And it was a calm morning, you know, the sun was shining. It was a lot warmer than it is here today. Um, and the boat's crew welcomed us. They were Christian, and when we got on board, they raised the Canadian flag, and they sang out Canada for us, and we embarked. And even though our group, you know, of Canadians made up the bulk of the passengers, I noticed that there was this other small group that was kind of off to the side. And, you know, I discovered, as we were out, out on the Sea of Galilee, uh, that uh, it was a small group of business people from Sweden. And they shared with me how they had come to Israel with each other in order to spend time together in prayer, talk about how they could better incorporate their Christian faith into their business practices. I mean, not only in how they conducted their business, you know, how maybe Christ had things to teach them that business school didn't, but share with others how knowing Jesus changed them and the way they conducted their business. And I was truly inspired by their witness and by their faith. And I can't begin to describe to you the joy I and others experienced when we gathered on the deck of that boat to share communion together, right? There's a bunch of Canadians, there was the boat's Galilean crew, there were the, these uh, uh, Swedish brothers and sisters. You know, and afterwards, one of the individuals from Sweden came up to me and thanked me for allowing them to join on the boat ride and to share in communion with us. And, and I must say, I spoke from my heart when I, I said to them, you know, I wouldn't have had it any other way because I knew that Christ wouldn't have it any other way. Because it wasn't me feeding them during communion on that boat ride. We were all fed by the Spirit. Right? That our strength was... Uh, our faith was strengthened because we stood together to confess our love of Christ and our connection to one another. Right? It was a moment of deep affirmation of how believing in Jesus can actually make speaking the hard words easy in places I never imagined I would be. Right? A moment of comprehension of how we are called to venture out and speak that word of love. It really does mean having a humble heart and an open mind. And it also means confessing your love for Jesus. But it is a confession that takes us to new places. That it may cause you to uh, reassess what you can do to make that Christian difference in the world. Participate in the resurrection. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard of Sarah Young. She's a, a Christian writer, has made it her mission to speak such words of love. 
I mean, after many years of writing to God in her prayer journals, she decided to, to set time aside time to listen to what Christ had to say. And she said how this journey changed her life forever. And she's written this series of devotional books over the years uh, that are titled Jesus Calling. And she uses this prophetic voice to speak you know, God's word to others and express what so many find hard to believe because it can be hard to say. You know, such as when she writes this about what Jesus has to say to her or through her. She writes, The closer to me you grow, the more fully you become your true self, the one I designed you to be. Because you are one of a kind, the path you are traveling with me diverges increasingly from that of other people. However, in my mysterious wisdom and ways, I enable you to follow this solitary path while staying in close contact with others. In fact, the more completely you devote yourself to me, the more freely you can love people. Rejoice as we journey together in intimate communion. Enjoy the adventure of finding yourself through losing yourself in me. You see, Jesus said, Simon, son of Peter, do you love me? I mean, how many times has he asked you that question? I mean, we know the answer. And it's by this love that we and many others are fed. Thanks be to God. As a people of faith, we acknowledge all that we have been given through the grace of a loving God. And we give as we have received to support the life and the work of the church, to further the work of love and justice, and to share God's truth. The offering will now be dedicated this day. And please remain standing that we might say together the words of a new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence 
to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. I invite you to be seated. And let us pray. God of the living, in this Easter season where life springs forth from earth once more, your creatures, great and small, sing your beauty and your of your goodness. For in this gift of creation, in the cycles of the seasons, and in the wonders of each creature, you reveal your grace and love. So teach us the gratitude we need that can dispel envy, that we might honor each gift in the same way you seek to love and honor us. Give us the grace to praise, to say the words, I love you. That we may offer to you our worship along with the work of our hands, our minds, and our hearts. That we might strive for the well-being of all creation. That we may find ourselves connected to one another by a spirit greater than any of us. And help us as we live, O oh God, each day to expect your grace. And may we let it surprise us that we might find ourselves thank, offering thanks for blessings we could have never imagined. Help us to remember how you are the one who comes with hope amongst the lonely and the despairing, the rejected and the outsider. You have stood among us and you feed us and you confess your love for us. And so may we confess our love as we give thanks for gifts we have received Thanks for the gifts we get to share and for this life we share with others. Oh God, we pray this day for each person whose vision of you or this, or their vision of life has become distorted because of so much that is untrue or unkind or unjust. We pray for ones who, who only surround themselves with themselves. We pray for those who are alienated or are alone. We pray for any person trapped in a place of cruelty, of violence, of war and division. Ones who feel helpless in the face of big problems. Give them peace of mind and a will of heart to still care. To care for creation, to live with intention and speak words of love that can inform loving action. And hear us this day as we pray for ones who suffer with mental illness. We pray for ones who are distressed, confused, estranged, misunderstood, anxious. Lord of life, we ask that your healing touch be upon so many, including those who mourn, ones who have suffered loss. We think today of people who are undergoing treatment or awaiting test results. 
We pray for people in places of violence and warfare in this world. But we dare pray for the possibility of peace. Peace even between ones who look in the face of their enemy and could never imagine saying, I love you. And hear us, O oh God, as we pray for our own congregation, for the community around us. And here at Woodlawn United Church, we pray that we might be faithful to you and to your spirit. Bless our efforts and give us the grace to value each contribution, both great and small. Give us the strength to persevere without counting the hurts, to find within ourselves the capacity to keep on loving. Mindful of your presence, may we move from, action, from prayer to action, from action back into prayer again. And help us to be companions for one another as we journey along this road. Inspire us to respond in ways that move us beyond barriers. And that the word of love that you have for us and for so many others might be heard. We pray this in Jesus' name who taught us and others to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I invite you to join your voices together in the singing of our closing hymn today, number 420, Go to the World. And I invite you to say with me our words of sending this morning. 
We are the hands and feet of Christ in this world we share. We each have a ministry to ease the suffering, to live with compassion, and to build up God's loving peace. As we go from this place of worship, let us encourage one another to share the gifts we have been given. By grace, may we speak the truth, uphold the beauty in others, and embrace the freedom of life in the Spirit. May we go in love, go in peace, and go with God. And as you go, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may God shower you with kindness and give you peace. Amen.